people say, Amen. Amen. It is great having Yoon back with us uh, from some time away during the summer, and we are glad to have our choir back with us this morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship with Morrisville Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to worship with all of you. Those who are here in the pews, welcome. Those of you that are worshiping from home, welcome. Those of you that are worshiping from wherever you are, welcome here to this place. And we are glad you are worshiping with us today. If you are here in the sanctuary this morning, you will find a red friendship folder in your pew. I hope that you will take some time to fill out that information and pass it along to the folks who are sitting around you, as this is a great way for us to greet one another by name during the service. And if you are new here with us this morning, I hope that you will take some time to fill out the extra information so that way we can follow up with you in the week and weeks to come. I also hope that you will look into our bulletin and find the many announcements of the life of this church. And there you will find that we had hoped to have a guest preacher this morning, Sam Yen Bata. Unfortunately, Sam found out yesterday afternoon that he had tested positive for COVID. Uh, he was very disappointed that he was not going to be able to lead us in worship today, as MPC holds a special place in his heart, knowing many folks on staff and who have come through the staff. And I hope that you will join uh, me in praying for his quick and whole recovery as well as that his family stays healthy. I have full faith that we will be able to see Sam with us again sometime in the near future. I would now like to invite Dan Jones forward for a minute for mission about our church scholarships. Good morning. One of the MPC's greatest gifts is our youth. Their faith, energy, and enthusiasm are so powerful for those of us who have the privilege of knowing them. Teaching them and learning from them, worshiping with, worshiping with them both here and then on a mountaintop in West Virginia, eventually they graduate and go into the world, many of them to college. Thanks to the generosity of those who came before us, we are able to send our youth off with scholarships. On behalf of the Youth Ministry Committee and MPC, it is a great joy and pleasure to announce four 2023 scholarships given to our youth by MPC. I'd ask the recipients to please stand when your name is called. Sydney Fluke. Sydney is receiving a Mary Carver Roberts Scholarship. Ella Carver Duke established the Mary Carver Roberts Scholarship in 1987 in memory of her sister Mary. This scholarship funds for those seeking a career in medical professions and ministry. Sydney, a sophomore at Loyola University in Chicago, is pursuing a degree in nursing. Congratulations, Sydney. Thank you. <laughs> Brian Burns. Brian is receiving a Helen Borden Scholarship. The family of Helen Borden established the Helen Borden Scholarship in memory of Helen in 2015. A longtime faithful member of MPC, I'm sure many of you remember Helen. Brian is a sophomore at Penn State University main campus where he is studying environmental systems engineering. Congratulations to Brian. AJ Nyman. AJ is, al is also receiving a board and scholarship. AJ graduated from Neshaminy High School this year and is headed to Westchester University to study physics, engineering, and minoring in music. Based on the talents that AJ has shared with us, I'm sure he will quickly become known as a singing physicist at Westchester. Congratulations, AJ. <laughs> Lizzie Stoner. Lizzie is receiving a McLennan Scholarship. The parents of Don McLennan established the Don McLennan Scholarship in his honor. Don's parents were members of MPC. Don grew up in Trenton and in 1954 formed the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, an international organization that today supports tens of thousands of Christian coaches and athletes in over 80 countries. Lizzie graduated from Ewing 
High School this year, and it's headed to a place near and dear to my heart, the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Go Tar Heels. Lizzie will be undertaking environmental studies. Congratulations to Lizzie. We thank God for those that have established these scholarships, and we thank God for our youth that means so much to us. Again, congratulations to all of them. Thank you, Dan. Indeed, we are blessed with many gifts given by God, the central one being the love and grace and good news of Jesus Christ in this world. So let us join together in worship. Another good morning to you. As you are able, please stand and join together in our responsive call to worship. We are the church, sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints. We are the church, together with those in every place who call on his name. We are the church gifted beyond belief through the power of the Holy Spirit. Grace and peace to you and one another. Let us worship God together. Ah, yes, okay. Please continue to stand and join us singing hymn number 280, Come, O Spirit, Dwell Among Us. Thank you.
in Jesus Christ. We are called to be a servant people. But we do not always do what God requires. Let us come before God confessing our sins in order that we may become the disciples we are called to be. Let us pray together the prayer of confession as found in the bulletin followed by silent confession. Let us pray. God of the ages, we do not always wait with patience. We do not always sing your praises. We do not always recognize your work in our lives. We would rather take the credit for ourselves. We would rather take the easy way out. We would rather step on others if it means more for ourselves. Forgive us for the, all the ways we forget. Help us to delight in your activity. Help us to trust in you. Help us to relish your gifts and return to the path of your righteousness. <clears throat> Just as Jesus called the disciples, so Christ calls us. Forgiven of our sin and free to serve, let us answer Christ's call. To let it, together, let us proclaim the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Christ has forgiven you. Look at one another and let us forgive each other. We can do so in peace. Let us share that peace with one another using American Sign Language. The peace of Christ be with you all and also with you. So let us share the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Also with you. As we approach a time for the hearing of scripture and the word proclaimed, let us prepare our hearts and minds in prayer. Let us pray. God, who could give the world anything, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. We pray that you may still our hearts and minds long enough to treasure your good news for us this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I waited patiently for the Lord. The Lord inclined to me and heard my cry. 
The Lord drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. The Lord put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Here I am. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
I would now like to invite our young friends forward for a time for young disciples. And we are going to make our way all the way up to the top steps of the chancel. You can follow me all the way up here. Yeah, come on up. Hello, hello. I'm so glad you all are here with us today. And I think we have some more friends coming. If you can see Anton and Rafaela coming, we'll wait for them because we have, we have a lot of time. Come on down. Let me place my bag here. Or do I have this? This helps me not forget my parts. Yeah. Hello, come on up. Come on up. It's good to see you all. It's great to see every one of you. I have a question. I have a question for you all. Have you all ever wanted to see the world differently? Have you ever wanted to look out there and see if there's anything that could be different? Sometimes when I get bored or maybe even sad or frustrated, sometimes I want to see the world differently and you want to know what I do. I go to my bag and I pull out my telescope. Don't tell the adults, but it's just my hands. You could do it too. Go like this. Make a telescope. Go like this. Do you think you could do it? And then put your eye in the telescope and look out. Does anything look different? Maybe the focus is a little different, or you see things in a way that maybe you hadn't before. Or sometimes I'll go into my bag and I'll pull out my binoculars like this. I go like, yeah, just like Anton's doing, just like that. And I look out and I see things differently. I like to do this when I'm bored or sad or frustrated, when I want to see the world differently. And it reminds me that God sees the world differently. It reminds me that when I'm on my way to work or school and I walk past the same tree like a hundred times, if I see the world differently, I can remember that God sees that tree as a house for a bird or a butterfly. Or maybe when I'm on, my, uh, I'm on a walk and I bump into somebody who was a little, they could have been a little mean. God sees that person and might understand why they might not have been nice that day. And so it's helpful for me to see the world and, and try and see the way God sees it. And I do this through th silly things like hand binoculars, or I do things like talking to other people or listening to beautiful music or praying and it helps me see the world in a way that's loving and kind. And I try to do that. So do you think that we can try and do that in this next week? See if we can do that together? All right. All right, if, if you're ready, let us pray together. Repeat after me. God, we thank you, God, we thank you. For, your world. for your world. And we pray that you help us see creation through your eyes. Amen. Well, you can head back to Mr. Carpenter for time for music, or you can head back to your seats. Very nice. <laughs> Seeing the world through God's eyes, holding hands with friends. As I mentioned in the welcome this morning, our guest preacher, Sam Yen Pata, was disappointed that he was unable to be here with us this morning. And since he found out about his illness yesterday afternoon, he sent along his sermon manuscript, manuscript which I edited and will be preaching from this morning. So let us dive into this sacred text with new ears and open hearts. Our second scripture reading comes from the first letter of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, chapter 1, 
verses 1 through 9. Together, let us listen for the word and wisdom of God. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those in who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to that end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the partnership of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Once upon a time, genetic engineers in a world renowned used the latest protoplasmic technologies and discovered how to create a human life form from scratch. The information and technology was shared with the UN along with the most prominent and upcoming scientists. The UN then decided to run a control experiment where a small number of ideal humans would be created and placed on an island of an ideal climate. The goal was to observe how such perfect creatures would relate to one another. Choosing the location was no problem. Choosing the ideal human makeup proved difficult. How many limbs should they have? Would the body be better served if the heart was on the right side instead of the left? If an extra finger was added on each hand, what would be the effect on music? Not only the way the instruments are played, but also the perspective of the composer. Would longer arms impact how cars and clothes would be made, or would the average sports scores dramatically increase? The scientists soon realized that any change in the human form would have significant evolutionary effects for society. So then, they did what Presbyterians do. It was decided that committees would be created, each with a special focus on each sector of society. Each committee was to convene for a year and to discuss the advantages and disadvantages from the changes they would make for this new image of God. Naturally, conflicts of interest emerged. The idea that the new creatures should come into the world with a full set of antibodies was refused by pharmaceutical companies. Insurance companies pushed for the creature's lifespan to be doubled, which the funeral homes vigorously objected to. Eventually, a well-working design for the ideal human was forged through compromises among most sectors, except one group, educators, therapists, and the dreaded clergy of all faiths had been most hindered about changes they may suggest. With more reflection, they finally agreed on one change. Readouts would be created that could show exactly what the creature was feeling and thinking and would be displayed on their foreheads. 
which of course hindered their playing chess, charades, and poker. But thus, the educators, clergy, and therapists, feeling successful, decided to allow the creatures to manage their own relations with one another, as long as they had this change. Finally, with support for this plan from all sectors of society, the date was set for the creatures to begin life at 5 a.m. on a Wednesday in May. And on the first day of life, everything went superbly well. Each creature knew exactly what to do, and they established cooperative partnerships everywhere. Traffic was free from snarls, lines at coffee shops moved at exactly the same rate. Some physicians even made house calls. There was no signs of violence. Relationships of all sorts were life-giving and joy-filled. Excellent body functions and souls programmed for healing were the norm. And at the end of the first day, all the creatures retired happy and fulfilled. They were gifted beyond belief and lacked for nothing. But on the second day, something went terribly wrong in the city. In fact, the entire project collapsed. For as each creature awoke and went through its morning preparation, it naturally glanced at the mirror, where it was curious to notice what could be read on its own forehead. And as each creature began to read its own thoughts and feelings, staring at them in the mirror, it became so fascinated with them, with what was in their head, that it just remained there, stuck in attitude, and none of them ever functioned again in their city. This fable, titled Narcissist, comes from rabbi and family therapist Edwin Friedman. So journey with me now to a different city, the city of Corinth which has some surprising similarities to our previous fable. Corinth, which is the setting of our letter from Paul this morning, the gospel mission of God through Paul in Corinth, in Corinth was to cultivate the ideal conditions for a unified and growing faith community. Yet rather than experiencing more first-day moments of unity, the congregation was experiencing second-day moments of stuckness. Individuals began to get stuck on what was in their heads rather than what was in the Godhead's plan and blessing for their church. From a 3,000-foot view, Corinth was home for a diversity of people who came from countries far and wide. People came to Corinth for two reasons mainly. First, either to make their living, or second, to stop for a while before traveling to another destination. From a 300-foot view, the congregation at Corinth was one of more than two dozen temples, altars, and shrines of various religions of all kinds. So Corinth was a multi-faith city for Greeks, Egyptians, and Jewish people. MPC family, between the 3,000 and 300-foot views, guess what was one of the main challenges for the church in Corinth. One of the main challenges for the church in Corinth was building long-standing relationships in the city in which they resided, in a city where people were coming and going. There were various reasons for this. Some people were misusing their spiritual gifts to gain power and control over other people. 
Instead of learning how to tolerate the anxiety and uncertainty of their time, others were seeking to gain power and control of their lives by relying on only philosophy to guide their living. This was in place of cultivating faith and a secure relationship with their God. To add, the congregants didn't know who to follow as their leader. Would it be Apollo, Paul, Cephas, or Jesus? Paul left the church in Corinth for some time and entrusted the leaders to continue the gospel mission. Yet in place of unity, anxiety, and fear were becoming the pastors of their gospel mission. So the main congregation in Corinth was struggling to move beyond their second days of stuckness. So what might you say is the purpose of this opening letter from Paul to the main congregation in Corinth that we find ourselves reading this morning? To this congregation mired in the bog of their stuckness. On one end, Bible scholars suggest that Paul is on the defensive writing in this letter. Since the congregation's security in their membership and faith and future was declining, and since there are new socio-cultural realities for them to learn, including the uncertainty of who their leader is, some biblical scholars say that Paul is writing to defend and re-establish his role as apostle and to set himself as the one who exemplifies living in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> but on the other hand, biblical scholars note that Paul is not defensive. They offer that Paul is seeking to strengthen the resilience and unity of the congregation. Paul wants to inspire and unify them to embrace the work ahead of them. This group of biblical scholars believe that the church has an opportunity to avoid their second day of stuckness. In other words, they believe that the church in Corinth is nearing the end of their metaphorical first day of cooperation as differences of opinion, behavior, and beliefs emerge. So as the congregation is looking for a fresh perspective on how to be strengthened, some biblical scholars say that Paul is not afraid or defensive. They say that Paul is simply and definitively being pastoral to the congregation. Between these two camps of biblical scholars, the clue to truest vision of Paul's relationship to the congregation can be felt in the impassioned expressions of Paul's introduction, the very verses we read today. It was Mother Teresa who said that a family that prays together stays together. It was a church billboard that read, seven days without prayer makes one weak. It was a kid who said God's name was Howard, you know, our Father, who art in heaven, Howard be thy name. I'm trying to drop hints here that our verses for today are not simply another version of Paul's standard greeting to begin a letter. The opening verses of 1 Corinthians are a prayer. We only pray three types of prayers in life, says Anne Lamont. Help, thanks, and wow. And Paul is praying a prayer of wow. He is inviting his congregation to step into that wow with him. He is extending the church a hand and asking them to believe, to feel, and remember their greatest gift. The greatest gift that they have and that we have is the love and grace of God made known through the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
And when we can see ourselves, others, and our community through the eyes of God's love, the testimony of Jesus can turn lack into liberation. Breakdown can turn into breakthroughs. Hurt can turn into healing, and stuckness can turn into strides. When we see ourselves, others, and our community through the eyes of God's love, grace, and the testimony of Jesus, we begin to see that we are gifted beyond belief. We begin to see that we can live again after second-day moments of stuckness. Those moments of grief, trauma, betrayal, and disappointment. For I, like Paul, am profoundly secure in my awareness that God unconditionally loves me and you because we are God's beloved. God has not worked out a design for our ultimate failure or irre irreparable destruction on a second day of stuckness. No, the arc of our story as Christians does not end with second day moments of death and burial. The arc of our story has always and, for and will forever be toward the third days of resurrection. So our testimony in Jesus Christ is the gift beyond belief. That Jesus gave us what we needed most, when we deserved it least, at great personal cost. So that when you feel stuck with more than what you can handle in life, you can grab hold of God's unchanging hand to walk you through the Red Seas of our time and anything you're going through. For we are beloved by a God who can, who has, and who will continue to make the best of our less than best circumstances for us. So hold on, Morrisville Presbyterian Church. The best is still yet to come. The promised land is here, and the time is now for this beloved church to lean further into its radical hospitality, its presence here in this community, its unconditional love for people of all ages, for God has always been forming hospitable people to put God's hospitality on display. And if you are in Christ, you are now a part of God's hospitable people. For hosp hospitality is not about entertaining. It is about engaging. And by remembering your identity and calling in Christ, you are gifted beyond belief to endure moments when the congregation of your family is physically close, yet emotionally distant from you. By remembering our hopeful testimony in Christ, you are gifted beyond belief to endure moments when the congregation of your feelings, thoughts, and actions are experienced by others as hurtful. By remembering our hopeful testimony in Christ, you are gifted beyond belief to endure moments when the congregation of your internal organs begin to manifest symptoms of stuckness and failure. To those who sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be God's holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the unbelievable gift that we have received in the testimony of Christ is as simple as this. Who God calls, God keeps. And God has called each of you by name as beloved saints. And God has, and God is, and God will continue to strengthen you until the third days of new life, new joy, and renewed membership. May these insights form and shape your strategic mission to build the house of belonging for each other and those who you have yet to know, for you are already gifted beyond belief. You are not in that second day of stuckness. 
you have entered the third day of resurrection. And indeed, you will journey on to new horizons together. So let us rise in body and spirit and as the beloved family of God to continue our praise with hymn number 691, Lord, when I come into this life. Please join me as we affirm our faith through these words from a brief statement of faith as they are printed in your bulletin. We trust in God the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture, engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation and calls people to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives, even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. God gives us the greatest gift of life, the good news and testimony of Jesus Christ in this world. So let us reflect on how we are called to give in response. 
whether it be our time, talents, or resources. Ushers, please come forward to collect our morning offering. reminds us that indeed you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. For indeed God does not call the equipped, but God equips the called. At this meal we bear witness to the generosity of our God and the possibilities of Christ's people. At this meal we begin to see a horizon beyond our second days of stuckness and into the third day of resurrection. So come and receive the gifts that God has in store for you. Let us give thanks to our God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy God, we praise you. Let the heavens be joyful and the earth be glad. We bless you for creating the whole world, for your promises to your people Israel, and for Jesus Christ in whom your fullness dwells. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Guiding his children, he leads us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Risen from the dead, he gives us new life. Living with you, he prays for us. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and this cup and proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this meal may be the communion in the body and blood of our Lord. Make us one with Christ, with whom all who share this feast. Unite us in faith. Encourage us with hope. Inspire us to love, that we may serve as faithful disciples until we feast at your table in glory. As we are gathered here around this table, O God, we also pray for ourselves, that we may be faithful channels of your grace in our communities, our homes, our families, and living for the sake of others in all our relationships. Be with families whose lives feel as parched as many places of the earth, who feel dry and weary. Be with families burdened with grief or brokenness or sickness and the anxieties that seem to be out of control. We lift up to you, Shirley and her family, and we pray for those who are sick and for those who are sick in their souls. Make the weak strong and the sick healthy and the broken whole. Hear us as we pray for Gary, for Dave, for Sam, for Eileen, and for Carol. And as we gather, help us all to love and to go throughout each of our days with the strength that you give us so that we might accomplish your purposes on earth, that in your good time, all peoples may serve you in harmony. We praise you, eternal God, through Christ, your word made flesh in the holy and life-giving spirit, now and forever. Amen. And with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus on the night of his arrest took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup. He blessed it. He poured it. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, This is the cup of the new covenant. Sealed in my blood, every time you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes back again in glory. I would now like to invite those who are serving to please come forward. And as they come forward, I want to remind you that this is not my table or Jack's table. 
or even Morrisville Presbyterian Church's table. This is Christ's table, and it is Christ that will meet you here. So come, come to this table, you who have much faith, and you who would like to have more. Come, you who have been to this table often, and you who have not been for a long time. Come, you who have tried to follow Jesus, and you who have failed. Come, for this is Christ's table, and it is Christ who invites you here. Let us pray. We thank you, O God, that through the word and sacrament 
You have given us your Son, who is the true bread from heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service, that our daily living may show our thanks through Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us continue our praise by singing hymn number 691. That's the wrong part of the book. Let's go. Hymn number 39. Beloved Church, we do not go out into this world alone, but with the gift of our God, the good news and testimony of the story of Jesus Christ in our lives that gives us hope for the future ahead. And as we go, may the peace of Jesus Christ go with you, wherever he may send you, 
May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into these doors. And all God's people say, Amen.